You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie in the U.S. And I'm Johanna from Austria, and you're listening to your favorite international podcast. The podcast that talks about murder, mystery, and the macabre throughout history. And no, we still haven't met in real life, and it's kind of our thing by now. Once Annie travels to Austria, I will be traveling to Australia. There will be <laughs> lots of logistics involved to make sure that we will never be on the same continent at the same time. We can't do it. Just can't happen. Yeah, it's a thing. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad you're with us for another episode of the Emergency Survival Podcast. Today, Avalanche. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, obviously. We know that not everybody was interested in hearing about what to do in case of emergency, different kinds of disasters. But you know, some of you like to listen to us when you fall asleep, and I really feel like those are the perfect episodes for that. There is useful information in there, so just put those two on repeat, and you're good. But you know, it was a subject very close to my heart, as I already told you. And, interestingly enough, we just had our monthly get-together for our murder tier patrons, and Melissa and John, huge shout-out to both of them, they told us that the last two episodes inspired them to check the dates, and they sure enough got all new smoke and carbon monoxide alarms because of that episode. So just knowing that, it was a thousand percent worth it to talk about all of these things and make sure you know it too. And honestly, I bet you they were not the only ones. If you want to know more about Patreon and all the other ways to support and contact us, please listen until the end because that's when we'll tell you all about that. Now it's time to get into this week's episode. So as we kept talking about hurricanes last week, and especially, obviously, about Katrina and Wilma, I started thinking about a couple of things that had to do with Katrina, and mostly about the murder of Eddie Hall. I don't know, it's one of those cases that had stuck with me for a long, long time. And so I messaged Annie about it and asked her if she remembered that case, and you said... Well, I, I basically said, I know nothing, please cover it. I honestly only know a couple of basic things about that case. I have to say that Katrina and its aftermath were a little bit of a daze for me. My first husband was killed by an elderly driver in August 2005, which was 13 months after we got married. I was 28. And... So at that time, my BFF from forever, Lara, and her amazing husband, who are like family, they flew to the Cape from New Orleans to be with the family and help out. And so it really wasn't very long after they returned to their home in New Orleans, and they had to evacuate. They said that losing Adam had really helped put the loss of material possessions in perspective because they and their dog, Lola, had made it safe, you know, but it was still awful seeing so many people suffering. I don't remember very much about it. It's it's one of those funny things that, that happened in the middle of a personal trauma. So mm. when when you mentioned this case, I know we don't usually cover newer episodes, but I really don't know anything about this. And some of what I've seen is really salacious. So I feel like you would probably tell me this story in the way I'd want to hear it. I, I hope so. I know you will. All it's, I know is it's terrible. It's a terrible case. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's horrible, horrible. It's um, It's always a little bit scary to talk about more recent cases. I mean, it's almost been 20 years, but for us, recent, right? Yeah. More recent than what we usually cover. That's right. It's going to be a double episode. We will talk a bit more about Katrina, but more from a social viewpoint, I'd say, and some of the other things that went on during and after the hurricane. And of course, I will tell you all I know about the life and tragic and absolutely brutal, brutal death of Eddie. And, of course, everything that I know about her murderer, Zach Bone. 
And we will give you a very quick, very, very basic overview about New Orleans and its history. We won't go into too much detail because we talked already at length about it in our episode about the X-Men of New Orleans. That's been a long time ago, right? Yeah, it, that really was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Annie, would you do us the favor to tell us at least a little bit about New Orleans? I would love to. So, for anyone who doesn't know, New Orleans is the most famous city in Louisiana, and definitely one of the most famous cities worldwide. I looked up the tourism stats and found the numbers for 2019. That year, 19.75 million people visited New Orleans. That's too many That's people. Yeah. I just saw the numbers published for cities in Europe. I think it was from 2023. And Vienna had 18 million visitors. Wow. But you have to say that um, lately a lot of people come to Europe and Prague had 20 million visitors. I think France had like, uh, Paris had like 40 million visitors. It's it's a lot. And I see the photos and I think like social media and Instagram has a lot to do with it. Plus that people couldn't really travel for, for almost three years. Yes. The places are hacked. Yes. Hacked. Yeah. Yeah. That's my situation. I'm traveling so much because I'm catching up on most of my travel is based around family stuff or seeing friends and family. And so you really get backed up on that during COVID. Yeah. That's a lot of people. Tourists don't only come from the U.S., but of course all over the world to visit the Big Easy. Fun fact, many people think that New Orleans is the capital of Louisiana, but that's actually Baton Rouge. I do think New Orleans is the biggest city in Louisiana population-wise, and I also have some other really fun stats for you when it comes to New Orleans. So, this information is from Where Yet... <laughs> It just took me a minute. Like, where yet is what it is. Where? Where yet dot com tells us. Right? That's how W-H-E-R-E-Y-A-T. Yeah. Where you at dot com tells us the following numbers. Quote, New Orleans was voted the best city for singles and the best city for gay dating. Gear up your dating apps. It also came in at number three on the list of cities with the highest percentage of singles and swiped one of the top five spots for most romantic cities. Apparently, New Orleanians aren't likely to take a spouse. We're simply not the Marian kind. The rate of marriage for males in New Orleans is the third lowest in the country, and for females, second lowest. New Orleans is the ninth worst city for traffic. The Big Easy beat out the Big Apple to be voted in the number one foodie city by U.S. News. Stick that in your knish, New York City. I can see that. The food was... Uh, I love old start on food, but New Orleans was like next level. Mm -hmm. oh, New Orleans is also the third best city for seafood and the 11th best city for a cup of coffee. And we have the second most ice cream shops in the country and... The most ice creameries per capita, almost twice as many as the average, in fact. All that fudge ripple and mint chocolate chip surely contribute to the fact that we have the highest sugar consumption of all American cities. Ooh, <laughs> look out, Pawnee. Also the beignets, probably. Right? They say we like to party in New Orleans, and they're not wrong. According to a U.S. News and World Report, New Orleans has the third best nightlife of American cities. What do you think are the top two? L.A. and New York? Miami. New York and Miami? Or just Miami Maybe. and... Miami and... Miami, L.A. Miami, New York. Nah, New York has a pretty good nightlife, I, I suppose. I don't know. Hmm. hmm. We have to check that out. Yeah. Tell us, if you're out there enjoying the nightlife these days, where is it hot? It's been a while since I've been into the nightlife. <laughs> I like the nightlife. I like to boogie. All right. It's also the second best festival city, Jazz Fest, and mm. the fifth most fun. <laughs> I find it interesting, like, overall, or <laughs> what are the four other places? 
Ah, uh, I don't know why I missed that one. It's so funny. And the fifth most fun. I feel like it's how my friends describe me. Like, she likes to read and she's the fifth most fun. <laughs> it's fine. I love this article. These are some statistics, y'all. Okay. By some statistics, Louisiana alcohol consumption ranks 22nd, which is pretty much middle of the road. And speaking of drinking in the middle of the road... <laughs> Why is this so funny? Is it the migraine or is it actually funny? Because <laughs> I don't know and I'm dying. And speaking of drinking in the middle of the road, everyone loves that you can drink right there in the street. Surely a factor in why New Orleans is the number one most popular bachelorette destination and the fifth most popular spot for bachelor parties. What's number one? First of all, Vegas. First of all, I have to say I've, I've always find it so funny because here you can drink whatever you want to drink in the street and nobody cares, right? Yeah. So because you're adults. <laughs> <laughs> but what I find interesting is the the discrepancy between number one for bachelorette destination and only fifth for bachelor. That's right. I'm sure bachelors prefer to go to Vegas, right? That that has to be their number one. Destination. My guess is Vegas is number one for bachelor parties. Yeah. Bachelorette parties does does it surprise me? I don't know. It's interesting though. The article continues. This is great. How much fun is anyone really having when the city is way down in the rankings as the 158th happiest city? Nonetheless, depending on who's doing the research, New Orleans always ranks high on the best cities lists, as high as the number 1 city to visit in the world the 10th most visited city, with the record number being the aforementioned 2019's 19 million visitors, and Travel and Leisure's second best U.S. city. You know who else really loves New Orleans? The vermin. The city crawled to the top of the list for cockroaches and ranked the number one most roach-infested city. This article. With friends like this, who needs enemies? Am I right? <laughs> Um, Orkin rated New Orleans the 37th most rat-filled city in 2022. That's not too bad. No, no. Moving on and finishing up here, the city is ranked the 27th best city for marijuana, but along with that high also comes the low. According to Twitter, New Orleans is the fourth worst city for potholes. <laughs> End quote. That's a lot to talk about there. Did you like New Orleans? Did you enjoy it? I mentioned it before when we talked about New Orleans. Look, New Orleans was always the number one city I was interested in visiting in the US. Yeah. Like that was pretty much the only city I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So I built it up in my head and made it really big. So I think nothing could have lived up to that uh, expectation I had in my head. I really, I think it's it's a beautiful city. I love the architecture, I love the history, I love the whole kind of macabre, dark, woodoey vibe they have. The food, everything is amazing. The people are amazing. But I didn't like the French Quarter. It reminded me a lot, a lot of the uh, hotel zone in Cancun, as in it's pretty much just like this huge party zone for adults. Yes. And very much so. That's not for me anymore. Anyway. Yeah, no. Yeah. I agree. I agree. But if you're if you're young enough to be into that, then it's Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can understand why people flock there. Oh yeah, yeah. It has a very special for me at my age when we went there, I very much preferred what the fuck, South Carolina. Oh, Charleston? Charleston, yes, exactly. I preferred Charleston. Did you go to Savannah too? Yes. I know you've told me all this, I just can't remember anything, so now, before Johanna tells you about Zach and Addie, here is some quick history on NOLA, New Orleans, Louisiana. That's how it's often, you'll see it, N-O-L-A, New Orleans, Louisiana. Nestled along the banks of the mighty Mississippi River, New Orleans, also referred to as the Big Easy or the Crescent City, is a unique amalgamation of French, African, Spanish, and American influences creating a vibrant tapestry that sets it apart from any other city in the United States. 
You might already have guessed it from the name of New Orleans and the state name Louisiana. This was once a French colony. The history of Louisiana is actually quite interesting. Like, I mean, what history of which part of the world is not interesting, am I right? Right. And we would have to do like 20 episodes to cover it all, which we're not here for. But in short, the French explorer René Robert Cavalier Sieur de la Salle claimed the region in 1682, naming it La Louisiane, in honor of King Louis XIV of France. However, French exploration and settlement in the area dates back way longer. In 1699, Pierre Lemoine d'Aberville established the first French settlement near present-day Ocean Springs, Mississippi. The French continued to explore and expand their presence in the Mississippi River Valley and along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. Louisiana became a significant French colony with the capital established in Mobile, which we know is now part of Alabama, in 1702, and later they moved it to Biloxi, which is in Mississippi today. In 1718, the capital was relocated to New Orleans, which became a key hub for French colonial activities. The French colony of Louisiana was characterized by its reliance on the fur trade, agricultural activities, and interactions with Native American tribes. In 1762, as a result of the Treaty of Fontainebleau, France ceded Louisiana to Spain to compensate Spain for its loss of Florida to the British. However, in 1800, through the secret treaty of San Ildefonso, Louisiana was retroceded to France. So that was a back and forth there for a while. <laughs> the most well-known chapter in the history of Louisiana occurred in 1803, when the United States under President Thomas Jefferson purchased the territory from France in the very famous, very, very I think the name is very famous, Louisiana Purchase, right? Mm -hmm. You must have learned everything about that in school. We did. I'm sure I've forgotten 99% of it now, but yes. So this acquisition doubled the size of the United States at the time and paved the way for the westward expansion. The transition from French to Spanish rule and eventually to American ownership left a huge mark on Louisiana's cultural landscape. You can't deny that. Mm -mm, absolutely. New Orleans itself was founded in 1718 by the French explorer Jean-Baptiste Lemont de Bienville and quickly became a melting pot of cultures due to its strategic location and the influx of settlers. The city's history is marked by the Spanish colonization, the impact of the Haitian Revolution on the influx of refugees, and the role of the city in the antebellum slave trade. Of course, all of these historical influences are still highly palpable in the architecture, cuisine, and traditions that define the city today. I just love the antebellum houses. It's I love them. So They're much so prettier. Pretty. So much prettier away from puritanical influence. I just, I love the architecture down there, all of it. Yeah. And I'm sure you went through the Garden District when you visited the city because that's where you find the most beautiful homes, in my opinion. Yes. My absolute favorite place to visit. And I not long ago bought an antique uranium glass hanging lamp light fixture from a home just a few doors down from the old Anne Rice mansion, and I still need to have it rewired. This is a really good reminder. It's amazing. But that lamp isn't all that New Orleans has to offer when it comes to architecture. See how I did that? Most famous, of course, is the French Quarter, with its iconic wrought iron balconies, narrow streets, and Creole townhouses. It stands as a testament to the city's French and Spanish colonial past. St. Louis Cathedral, overlooking Jackson Square, is a striking example of Spanish colonial architecture and a symbol of the city's deep Catholic roots. Another style of houses are the so-called shotgun houses, with their colorful facades, and they're another architectural gem that dot the cityscape, reflecting African and Caribbean influences. Lair and Kevin lived in a shotgun house in in New Orleans. it's They're called that because you could open the front door. If you open the front and yeah. back door, you could fire a shotgun straight through. And it would go right they're through like the They're like long and narrow and so pretty, so cute. I love so them. cute. I love them too. Really cool. One of the defining characteristics of New Orleans is its commitment to preserving and celebrating its cultural heritage. The city is renowned for its music scene, with jazz being the heartbeat that resonates through the streets. 
from the soulful tunes emanating from Preservation Hall in the French Quarter to the lively brass bands parading through the streets during Mardi Gras. New Orleans' musical legacy is both diverse and enduring. Mardi Gras encapsulates the city's spirit of revelry, blending tradition and modernity in a kaleidoscope of color and sound. Apart from Mardi Gras, New Orleans hosts numerous other festivals that showcase the diverse cultural influences. The Jazz and Heritage Festival celebrates the city's musical heritage, while the Essence Festival, founded in 1995, highlights African-American culture, music, and empowerment. The city's culinary scene is equally impressive, blending French, African, Spanish, and Caribbean flavors into a unique Creole and Cajun cuisine. Gumbo, jambalaya, beignets. Which ones? Gumbo. Gumbo. I love it. I make it very often at home now. Mm. From a recipe book I bought there. It's so good. Nice. So good. Beignets for me. Mm-mm. Also po'boys. Just a few of the delectable dishes that have become synonymous with New Orleans. Today, New Orleans stands as a testament to the enduring power of culture and community, its historical roots, architectural wonders, vibrant traditions, and resilience in the face of adversity make it a truly unique and captivating city. That's true. That's yeah. really true. And that's the city where Adrian, Eddie Hall, and Zachary, or Zach Bone, met in 2005. The sources for this case are documentaries, like for example, Second Eddie by Rob Florence from 2013, or the episode Graveyard Love from the Final Witness show that aired on 4th of July 2012. These documentaries are especially interesting because they include many interviews with family and friends. Of course, I also use contemporary newspaper articles, and a big source was the book Shake the Devil Off, a true story of the murder that rocked New Orleans by Ethan Brown. The author focuses a lot on the why, and he also focuses on wartime PTSD as a possible explanation, but we'll get into all of this later on. Of course, as always, the sources I used will be listed in the according post on Facebook, and if you have any questions about any of the sources, please never hesitate to contact us. Also, please be aware that this is a rather recent case, at least, as we said, compared for what we mostly cover on this podcast. I won't be naming the names of the families. They are all victims too, in a way or another. And in my opinion, they deserve privacy, especially the kids. Yes, some have been outspoken about all of this and the names are out there, but that doesn't mean we have to. We have to really name them. I hope that's okay for you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Zach Bone was born on 15th of May 1978 in Bakersfield, California, and grew up with his parents and sibling in a couple of different places, mostly Ojai, but also Whitby, I hope I pronounced it correctly, in Washington. Ultimately, the parents did split up and Zach moved with his mom and sibling back to California to Santa Maria, where he attended high school. As he grew up, he was rather well liked. He was not unpopular in school and he had friends. He was kind of an outgoing kid who was also helpful and kind to others. Apparently very funny too, but he was also a bit of an outsider covering up his rather shy persona with being, you know, silly and, and lots of joking. He liked heavy metal, he played the drums, he had long hair, and he had no plans for his future, aside of hoping for a career in music. At 17, he had set his heart at becoming Homecoming King. For those of you outside of the US and who not grew up on 80s and 90s US movies and TV shows, Annie, do you want to tell us what's the Homecoming King and Queen? Oh, well, yes, they are elected by the student body during the homecoming festivities. Homecoming is a traditional event held by schools and universities, usually in the fall, to welcome back former students. So you're coming home, right? The celebration often includes various activities like football games and parades, dances, and of course, the crowning of a homecoming king and queen. The king and queen are elected through a voting process involving students, and they are often students who are well-regarded by their peers, involved in school activities, and contribute positively to the high school community. It's um, 
It's kind of a popularity contest, but not necessarily in a bad way. It used to be always the most popular kids, like the captain of the football team and the... The cheerleader. And the cheerleading. Yeah, exactly. I think yeah. that kind of was the norm. I think the focus has shifted a little bit. I don't think it's necessarily a, a popularity contest in a bad way. I guess that would be the way mm -hmm. to say it, right? So... Zack didn't become homecoming king, and that was a bit of a blow to his self-esteem, according to his mom. His grades got worse, and ultimately he dropped out of high school during his senior year in 1996, and he moved to Washington to live with his dad, who had stayed there after the divorce. I don't necessarily think that that was all caused by him not becoming homecoming king, but I think that was kind of a, a theme in his teenage years, that he felt a little bit like an outsider, and... I don't know. Maybe he had... It didn't take a lot to send him over a tipping point, sort of. Like... Yeah. Yeah. And once Zach arrived in Washington to live with his dad, the two set out on a cross-country road trip. The plan was to drive all the way to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, making stops in places like Savannah and New Orleans on the way. They actually ended up staying in New Orleans for a few months, Zack's father was working as a bartender and they had rented an apartment and Zack even attended a local high school. That didn't last long though and once more he dropped out of school after only a couple of months. Zack was 18 at that point, he was rather tall and <laughs> Annie and I both tried to do the calculations and I got it wrong the first time and I was like, that's not that tall. And then Annie was like, how? That's super tall. She was like, he's he's 6'10", and I'm like, 6'10"? If we calculated correctly, then he would have been 2, two meters, 8 centimeters, which is really tall. Yes, I admit that. Or 6 foot 10. Uh, he had cut his hair short by then, and overall, I think, unarguably, he was a handsome young man. I actually, hang on, I have absolute. I literally, this is how little I know about the case. I'm going to look it up right now, um, because I actually don't know what he looks like. Oh, he is tall. He's got a nice face. He's tall. Yeah. He started working at bars in the French Quarter, and that's where he met his future wife. And as I said before, I don't really want to use her real name, nor the real names of the children, so let's just call her Sarah, right? Yeah. Sarah was 28 and worked as a dancer, in New Orleans and met Zach one night while being out partying with her friends and the two started dating, but Sarah had absolutely no idea that Zach was actually only 18. After a while, he admitted his true age and Sarah started to distance herself from the teenager. I mean, I can see how she would have assumed automatically that he was in his early 20s. He was tall and he was working as a bartender. I mean... Absolutely. Should be 21 at least, right? Yes. In the States. Yes, exactly right. She probably thought that she was, what, 28 and he was 22 or 23 or something, which is not that big a deal. Like, yeah, that's too much of an age difference. At least it would be for me. At least he was 18. It could have been worse. Like, from a her perspective, like, that's such a nightmare, but thank God he was at least 18, right? So she tries to distance herself, but then Sarah discovered that she was actually pregnant with sex chart. No. Yeah, and she told him that she was going to have the baby and that he could be as involved or not involved as he wanted to be. And how did Zach react? Well, we know how he felt from a letter he wrote to his mom, where he informed her that he was going to be a dad and that he regrets it deeply and that he doesn't feel ready. I mean, I understand at 18, that's that's a scary thought. Yeah, I think you want more than a year between hoping you're voted homecoming king yeah. and picking out baby names. Like in an ideal yeah. world, those things don't happen quite so consecutively. Yeah, yeah. I mean, things happen and... They do, of yeah. course they do. But my parents were super young parents, you know. Exactly, that's it. We're not, we're never, we're never saying... Not judging. No, no judging, no. ever, never. Not from us. What I want to say is I understand that it's uh, overwhelming and scary for an 18-year-old. Absolutely. He also says that the mother of the child was set on keeping the child and that he felt stuck now, but that he was trying to be a responsible parent, stay in New Orleans and wait for his child to be born. Quote, I believe she will make a good mother who will love this child, but I just wish she could have waited for an older more responsible person than myself to share this with. But now I'm stuck. 
I'm going to stay in New Orleans until the child is born and see it through part of its infancy, but in no way will I be its daddy. I could have chose the easy way out and ran from this like I have all my other problems, but I couldn't do that to her. I have a responsibility to uphold and damn it, I'm going to do it. I figure that if I want to play the gamble, then I need to be willing to uphold the consequences, end quote. So this is just an excerpt from the letter. You can find the whole letter or or most of it in detail in the book I mentioned before. Shake the devil off. That last quote, the, if I want to play the gamble, then I need to be willing to uphold the consequences, is a perfect example of his youth. It's just an example of how young he is, because none of those are quite right. It sounds like a child trying to be Use words you know, sweetheart. They don't have to be fancy. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. You know what I mean? But like, I don't know. If I want to play the gamble, then I need to be willing to uphold the consequences. Yeah. Is that a phrase somewhere, just not here? But I think, I mean, what he means is that if he, you know, the typical when people say, well, if you if you want to have sex, you also have to deal with the consequences, totally. which is... Yeah. I understand what he's trying to say. I mean, yes, on one part, but also no. It's it's, it's complicated. So complicated. It's yeah. yeah. I mean, this is the thing. These are all I can understand her deciding surprise, she's pregnant and she wants the baby, yeah. and I can also totally understand him feeling like not ready for this. Yeah. But sex feelings towards fatherhood seem to have changed after their son was born in summer of 1997. He immediately loved his son so deeply and really wanted to be there for him. He started working several jobs parallel to provide for his little family and ultimately he proposed to Sarah. The couple got married in the middle of Jackson Square in fall of 1998 when Zach was 20 years old. Sarah was pregnant with their second child. So now they are married and there are two children to take care of. Zach works several bartender jobs, but it's hard and he wants to provide a stable home for his children. So the first thing he does, he gets his high school degree, which is a smart, good decision, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. And then he decides to join the military. He enlisted for an eight-year term. He started with his basic training in Missouri, Missouri, in summer of 2000. Me, personally, coming from a bartending and and server-waitressing background, I can't even imagine how hard it must have been to go from a rather unusual daily schedule to the strict military lifestyle, but apparently Zach took it rather well and adapted quickly. This is a great moment to take a quick break for a word by this week's sponsor, The Art of Crime. I'm sure you already heard us talking about this podcast and how much we are genuinely pumped about their latest season, which is called The Queen of Crime. And we think you will be too. The Art of Crime is the ultimate blend of true crime, art, and history, making it a must-listen for anyone fascinated by the darker side of the past. Absolutely. If you haven't tuned in yet, you're really missing out. Grab your favorite podcast app and queue up The Art of Crime right away. Well, after you finish our episode, obviously. We've been hooked since their first season where Gavin delved into the shady world of art suspects in the Jack the Ripper case. Season 2 then explored assassins and their intriguing victims, including the chilling attempted murder of Andy Warhol and the infamous assassination of Abraham Lincoln by John Wilkes Booth. That's right, and now Gavin and his team are back with a brand new season that unravels the extraordinary life of Marie Grossholz, a.k.a. Madame Tussaud. Madame Tussaud, indeed. This season peels back the wax-coated layers of her world, exploring the macabre tales that made her a household name from pre-revolutionary France to Victorian London. The Art of Crime will tell you everything about the woman who became one of the greatest show women in the world and her empire of wax. Madame Tussaud became a household name in the world of wax figures that attracted everyone and their grandma to gawk at the life-size figures, including moi, replicating not only famous royals, politicians, and artists, but also the most notorious criminals you can imagine. The newest episode, Red Barn Murders, spills the beans about the time Madame Tussaud showcased one of the most infamous murderers of his time, William Corder, in her touring show. 
You will be absolutely shooketh. 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 Shooketh, we say. Shooketh. <laughs> if you consider yourself a history buff, and we know you do, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. That's true. Or a true crime aficionado. Mm -hmm. The Art of Crime is a must listen. Subscribe on your preferred podcast platform and stay connected via Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube for bonus content. Mm -hmm, that's right. And of course, don't forget to explore their website, artofcrimepodcast.com, where you'll find transcripts, bibliographies, and archival images for each episode. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories where art, history, and true crime collide in unexpected ways. Happy listening, and tell them we said hi. After basic training, he was sent to Germany, and once there, he made a lot of new friends, not only among his military buddies, but also among German natives. When talking about him later, they would describe him as funny, kind, and considerate. Uh, he was helping friends in need whenever possible, for example. Maybe some of you will roll their eyes now and think that I'm over here describing this man as this great guy when, after all, he committed an unbelievable and extremely gruesome murder. And I really just hope you understand that I'm in no way trying to paint him in a sympathetic light or try to find excuses for what he was going to do. In this first part, I can only tell you what people said about him and his life, and I just want to give you a complete picture here. That's not my opinion on him. That's right. not in any way trying to excuse what was going to happen. It's just, you know, what his friends and family said about him. And as we see often, there are no excuses, but maybe looking at the whole picture can make us as society be able to prevent certain things from happening in the future, if that makes sense. It does. It makes absolute sense. This is why I wanted to study abnormal psych in my undergrad. You're not trying to excuse the behavior, but you're trying to explain it. You know, you're looking because if you can find a possible explanation, if we can pinpoint a reason why someone, because everyone starts out as someone's baby, right? I mean, apart from a few mm. small outlying cases, but like, how does someone go from being a nice, well-liked, all-around person to someone who does something terrible. And if we can understand yeah. the how and the why, then we can try to prevent terrible things from hopefully happening again, right? That's why we're so curious. The other thing we want to be super crystal clear on, and we've said this before, but we talk a lot about uh, mental health and PTSD, and we want to be clear that while occasionally people with PTSD do terrible things, that's really not the norm. With all mental health stuff, you are much, much more likely to harm yourself than someone else. Or be harmed by others. Exactly right. Or be taken advantage of and harmed by other people when you're suffering from PTSD or any kind of mental illness. So while these things do sometimes happen, they are by no means the norm. I just think it's important to talk about these things to, to see how important help is also for mental health situations, which is yes. still way too little help out there, right? Well, and also, if we don't talk about the, and I don't even actually, I don't know yet the details and what happens with this with this person, but assuming, what's, what am I trying to say? It helps us to understand how someone could be attracted to their murderer in the first place, right? Mm. It dispels that idea that oh, you know, here's your friend Annie, and she's dating this guy, and he looks like an absolute sociopath who has bodies in the yeah, basement. And I know what you mean, a yeah. And kidnap trip kit in the trunk, you know? That's not what people look like. That's why Ted Bundy is so infamous, right? It's like the scariest people sometimes. That would also put, again, a lot of blame on the victim. Like, if it would be so easy to pinpoint Exa that's what to I'm people saying. who would do something terrible. Yeah. yeah, we have to understand that these are people who who were capable of good things. Being adjusted enough. Yeah. yeah, at some point. You know, how did it all go wrong? When did it all go wrong? And so often, like I'm sure is probably the case here, it's not just one thing. That would be easy. If you could say, oh, well, this causes that, that would be great. But that's not how it happens, It's just right? the PTSD or it's just exactly. drugs or it's, yeah. Mm. Exactly. Yep. 
So in January of 2001, Sex Company was deployed to Kosovo as part of the K4 on a peacekeeping mission. The Kosovo War took place between 1998 and 1999. I mean, it was all part of the, the war in former Yugoslavia. Basically, the conflict arose due to tensions between ethnic Albanians who constituted the majority in Kosovo and the Yugoslav government. Ethnic Albanians in Kosovo saw greater autonomy and independence, leading to clashes with Yugoslav security forces. The situation escalated, prompting international concern about human rights abuses and the displacement of civilians. In 1999, NATO intervened with a military campaign against Yugoslavia, aiming to stop the violence and ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. The air campaign lasted for 78 days and ultimately ending with a peace deal and the withdrawal of Yugoslav forces from Kosovo. Subsequently, the Kosovo forces, so that's K4, was established in June of 1999 as a NATO-led international peacekeeping force to maintain a secure environment in Kosovo. K4's mission included ensuring the withdrawal of Yugoslav forces, preventing the return of hostile forces and supporting the establishment of a stable and democratic Kosovo. Of course, this is an oversimplification of the war in ex-Yugoslavia, and there would be so much more to talk about, even regarding current day affairs. Oh, yes. But after all, that's a way too big topic for our little podcast here, and I really just wanted to give you a basic information on why SEC was even there, right? Mm -hmm. When he arrived in Kosovo, the war was over, but the region was far from being stable. And the most horrible part, of course, was the uncovering of mass graves that his company was tasked with. So he was part of that, of of dealing yeah. with the, the yeah. aftermath of the genocide? Apparently, yeah. 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 I oh. don't know if he was uh, immediately involved with that, but his company definitely was involved with the, with the uncovering the mass graves and, and removing the bodies and all these kind of things. Sack returned to Germany in 2001, and that summer he was able to finally move his wife and children overseas to join him at the military base. So everything was fine for a while, and then 9-11 happened, and with it came war. In response to the 9-11 attacks, the United States, under the leadership of President George W. Bush, initiated the war on terror, the primary focus, or let's say the official focus was to dismantle Al-Qaeda and its leadership as well as to address the broader issue of global terrorism. There's also a whole discussion to be had about this, but again, that's a way too big topic yeah. for us. The war involved military interventions in Afghanistan and later Iraq. The war in Afghanistan, known as Operation Enduring Freedom, began in October of 2001. The objective was to remove the Taliban regime, which had harbored al-Qaeda and provided a safe haven for its operatives. The US-led coalition sought to dismantle al-Qaeda's infrastructure and prevent future terrorist attacks. The conflict in Afghanistan evolved into a prolonged and very complex military engagement uh, that lasted decades, as we know, involving multiple nations and groups. In 2003, the United States, along with a coalition of allies, also initiated the Iraq War, Operation Iraqi Freedom. The rationale for this war included concerns about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and the belief that Saddam Hussein's regime posed a threat to regional stability. However, subsequent investigations found no evidence of weapons of mass destruction, and thus this war became highly controversial. By the end of 2002, Sack's company was deployed to Kuwait and then on to Iraq. Sack and his company encountered action pretty much as soon as they crossed over to Iraq. They slowly moved towards Tikrit and then on towards Baghdad, where they arrived one week after the capital had fallen. Sack's company set up base in a former palace that once had belonged to Isad al-Duri, Saddam Hussein's right-hand man. I found this kind of interesting article uh, in Stars and Stripes. Well, it's an excerpt from the article that talks about the 527th company. So that, that's a company SEC was part of. And this article is by David Joser and it was published on 5th of May 2003. Quote, Baghdad, Iraq. Soldiers from the 527th Military Police Company 
based in Gießen, Germany, have been mighty busy the past six weeks, but are finally catching a break. During the last month and a half, the MPs crisscrossed Iraq, moving from Camp Virginia in Kuwait to Tilkrit and Nazaria in Iraq. They operated rolling checkpoints, escorted convoys, seized massive amounts of weapons and transported enemy prisoners of war. Two days ago, they reached the vice presidential palace in Baghdad and are now preparing for the next phase of the mission, which is to train and help organize the city's police force. It's going to be tough, said Army Captain Mike Johns, company commander of the 227th. Everything has been looted. There are no records, no radios, no weapons. I think they have a couple police cars. End quote. Before they start working with the Iraqis, the soldiers have had spent several days cleaning their new living quarters. They are building makeshift latrines, getting power from generators, pumping out the flooded palace basement and have adopted two dogs. One blind dog and one puppy that live behind the fenced-in compound. They are also getting a chance to read mail. Life, the soldiers say, has gotten better after the sandstorms and constant movement that had defined their lives. I got seven care packages today, said Sergeant Stephen Palazzo, a military policeman from Gießen. In each package were letters, and one even included pictures of his infant son, wife, and puppy. His wife had included, in blue paint, a footprint from his son and a paw print from his dog. End quote. Oh, it's so much work. I'm really glad they found the puppers, a blind dog yeah. and a puppy. Ugh. Zack, like many of his fellow soldiers, started questioning the necessity of the war in Iraq and became more and more resentful towards the military, especially when his wife fell sick and he was denied leave to visit her back in Germany during her treatment. Which, I get both sides in this, but I think it's hard. They're in a, in a war situation and allowing one soldier to fly back to Germany to see his wife might not seem like big of a deal, like it's just one soldier, right? But everybody has family and yeah, they don't, it's, it's hard. Yeah, They don't just let you fly home because you're sick. My mom had quite a few big, big things happen when my dad was in Vietnam, but he only got leave to fly back when they thought she was going to die. If you're probably going to be all right, no one's going home. Living under the constant attacks and the threat of possible death didn't help the situation for Zach Bone at all. And of course, soon he had to experience the loss of comrades and close friends, as well as civilians he had kind of formed relationships with. I will not go into all the details of everything that went on in Iraq, especially with the 527th Company. If you want to know more about it, please read the book I cited as source. There you'll find several chapters that go into much detail. I think we can all imagine how scary and stressful and traumatizing the whole experience was for everyone involved on all sides. Oh, yeah. There are a lot of books out there you can read on the war. Like, just so many options. Finally, by the end of 2003, the 527th made its return to Germany. But Zack returned a changed man. Where he had been talkative, outgoing, and overall happy, he was now quiet and introverted depressed and often angry. He also complained about frequent headaches and shortness of breath. Sarah found it difficult to connect with her husband after his return. Yeah, the stuff you've mentioned, the character changing, the headaches, that's definitely all signs of PTSD. And we've spoken about it on several occasions, most famously probably in our episode about Clara Harris. Which was especially interesting because I have the feeling we often look back at people from the past and think like, well, they were so much tougher. They were uh, in battles. They saw war. They saw tragedy. And they just didn't crumble. Yet yeah, they did, but nobody talked they about did. it. And they were just expected to go on with their lives. That's and right. Deal with and it. Yeah. there are lots of people today who are still expected to do that because of the stigma, this ridiculous notion that if you need mental health care, it's any different from needing insulin or heart meds. You know, it's all, it's all the same. I'm absolutely certain that the Vikings experienced PTSD. Uh-huh. It's always been part of Oh yeah. trauma. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. War-related PTSD, I can't obviously personally speak to, but it has a profound impact on persons, on a person's daily life, their relationships, and overall well-being. It could interfere with their ability to function in 
lots of roles like their work, their family, and social settings. And it's important again, again, to note that not everyone who experiences trauma during war or any other experience will necessarily develop PTSD. If you do, there's nothing wrong with you. If you don't, there's also nothing wrong with you. And of course, every individual responds to traumatic events differently, right? It's just so important to recognize these problems for what they are and to offer help without judgment, right? And again, we reiterate that most people with PTSD are not dangerous, but at risk. Yeah, absolutely. It's a terrible thing. So Zach was back at the military base in Germany, and he started failing his physical tests, probably sabotaging them on purpose by failing the sit-ups or push-up part, as far as I read. And finally, in fall of 2004, he was dismissed from military service and sent back home to the US, where he returned to New Orleans. By then, his marriage was also in shambles, and he and Sarah went their separate ways, even though they were still living together. Zach started working as a bartender in the French Quarter again, and that's where he met Adrian Hall, called Eddie. She worked at the same bar for a while, and he was extremely smitten with her from very early on. Eddie, though, had absolutely no interest in him whatsoever. She was this kind of a young, free-spirited, hippie girl, dance instructor, seamstress. She had this very artistic soul and found Zach, who was freshly discharged from the military, to be the complete opposite of what she was mostly interested in. She even found him to be kind of corny and almost cringy with his magic tricks he used to entertain the bar patrons with, but Zach was absolutely set on pursuing her and winning her over. Eddie was born on 15th of January 1976 in North Carolina, which made her 29 when she met Zach in late spring, early summer of 2005. I wish I could give you just as much or actually more info on Eddie as I just did on on Zach, but all I know is this. Originally, she was from Durham, North Carolina. She had dropped out of high school She had traveled the country for a while, basically living a life on the road and couch surfing. Eventually, she had returned to Durham, where she worked as a dance instructor for a while. Uh, In 2002, her adventure bug couldn't be silenced any longer, and she left Durham to move to New Orleans with a friend of hers. She lived in a car for a couple of weeks until she could find a room to rent. Eddie made friends easily. She was extremely smart, had a great sense of humor, and was so talented when it came to sewing and writing. She loved John Waters and even met him once and got his autograph. I think he uh, he signed a copy of Catcher in the Rye for her <laughs> because she had mm-hmm. it on her. <laughs> she worked many jobs in New Orleans. She worked as a maid, a waitress, and of course as a bartender. She was very, very popular among the customers, always great to talk to and know how to entertain. When her friends remember her, they talk about this extremely nurturing side that she had to her, that she was funny and friendly one moment, but could also be very feisty and confrontational the next, especially when out partying. I think that's part of a set of skills, Uh, quotation mark skills that you develop if you live a rather unstable life, I'd say, especially working at bars, being surrounded by often very inebriated and possibly abusive people. You know what I mean? I do. It's also this wild side people have can also sometimes have a very dark side to it. And I also want to mention that uh, there seems to have been a horrible abusive situation going on when Eddie was a child, including sexual abuse. I think it's safe to say that Eddie, too, had experienced quite some trauma in her past and would often use alcohol and other drugs to self-medicate at times. And I don't want to sound in any way blaming her for anything that was going to happen. It's just, again, part of her story. Absolutely. And that's also everything you've been saying is common and understandable, like on both sides. Also... She, in the pictures, because I've only just found the picture of the two of them together, she, do you know what she reminds me of? If Luna Lovegood from the Harry Potter movies grew up. Yeah. She's really pretty. 
and a tiny, tiny frame. T- like she, I was she just was five say, feet. Yeah, yeah. She looks gorgeous. Tiny. Long blonde hair. Yeah, she looks like a little pixie. She reminds me of Luna Lovegood in those movies. Like that girl could play her. It's no surprise, I think, that Zack was smitten with her and that he was trying to win her over. And eventually he did succeed. And I want to step on a soapbox real quick here. This is not an invitation for anyone out there to ignore a no. Uh, don't become a creepy stalker, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. I think what had happened was that eventually the two had started to hang out a bit after their shifts and they really got to know each other. And somehow Eddie fell for Zack. And they started dating. And friends of Eddie said that she seemed to be really deeply in love with him. And they both seemed very happy. And then, by the end of August 2005, their young relationship would be put to test. As Hurricane Katrina developed into a menacing Category 5 hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico during August of 2005, or late August of 2005, concerns mounted over its potential impact on New Orleans. By 27th of August, Mayor Ray Nagin made the difficult decision to issue a mandatory evacuation order for the city. The urgency stemmed from the anticipated severity of the storm and the vulnerability of the city's levee system, heightening the risk of catastrophic flooding. We talked about it a little bit last week, despite the issuance of mandatory evacuation orders. The evacuation process faced formidable challenges. Limited resources and infrastructure posed hurdles for residents who lacked the means to leave, and the city struggled to provide sufficient transportation for the entire population. Evacuation routes experienced severe traffic congestion, which hampered the timely departure of many residents. These challenges underscored the need for a comprehensive and accessible evacuation plan in the face of imminent natural disaster. So, this is a reminder of what we were talking about yeah. last week, right? If you are running from a tidal wave, if you're at the beach and there's an earthquake and you need to go, you're better off just running than grabbing a car, if you can. And a few people living in the French Quarter had decided to stay, and Eddie was one of them. She was actually frantic and terrified of the coming storm, understandably so, so Zach decided to stay with her. Sarah, who he was officially still living with in the in the apartment, was extremely upset that he had decided to stay with his new girlfriend and not come home to help her and the children to either evacuate or bunker down. She even offered him to bring Eddie over to their place so that they could all get through it together. But he was actually firm on his decision. He was going to stay with Eddie in her apartment in the French Quarter. And he simply told his wife, the mother of his children, "Ah, you're going to be fine. Literally. And that was it. Wow. So, it sounds like a big personality change after the war. If their relationship deteriorated, they were divorced, and then... I think they were not divorced yet, even. I think they were just separated, yeah. In the process. But it just seems like this is another further step, you know? And I read an interview with with his first wife, and she said she was re- she had no problem with with him bringing her over, Eddie over. And I think that right. would have made the most sense, actually. Right. right, it would have absolutely being all together. She she was left alone with two children. I don't like yeah. that at all, honestly. No, 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 none of this is okay. But I think this shows how unclearly he's thinking. So Zach and Eddie uh, hunkered down in her apartment with beer, liquor, ice water and some groceries and boarded up windows. On 29th of August 2005, Hurricane Katrina made landfall on the Gulf Coast, unleashing catastrophic storm surges that overwhelmed the city, transforming the event from a natural disaster into a severe humanitarian crisis, prompting urgent and massive search and rescue operations. Katrina's peak sustained winds reached an astonishing 280 kilometers per hour or 175 miles per hour, making it one of the most powerful hurricanes in recorded history. The wind intensity and the storm's massive size contributed to its capacity to inflict widespread destruction, and as the storm made landfall, its powerful winds were responsible for uprooting trees, demolishing structures, and causing unprecedented storm surges. One of the most critical aspects of Hurricane Katrina's impact was not only the wind, 
but the failure of the levee system in New Orleans. The storm surge, exacerbated by the city's vulnerable location below sea level, overwhelmed the levees, leading to multiple breaches, the failure of the 17th Street Canal and the Industrial Canal levee unleashed a torrent of water, and it's unbelievable. It submerged yeah. 80% of the city under depth reaching up to 6 meters or 20 feet. It's too much water. Yeah, yeah. literally. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good place to leave for this week. We will be back next week with part two where we'll talk about the aftermath of Katrina, some facts when it comes to other crimes going on during the time, and of course, the absolutely brutal murder of Adrian Hall. I'm a little nervous about what happens next. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have something good to end this episode with? Yeah, what was it going to be? My something good is that one of my brothers was just visiting and we went along with my birth mom and my husband to go see a preview of Dune and the new Dune was, it did not disappoint. It did not. I, we enjoyed it very, very much. I still need to see the first one. Yeah. You'll enjoy it and see the second one in the theater if you can. Yeah. We're really lucky. I'm lucky. My something good is that I live so close to a really quality IMAX theater. And so I'm spoiled by my movie theaters. Yeah. My something good is that, oh my God, so many flowers are already coming out in my garden. I have daffodils already. I have forsythia blooming already. <gasps> Not the forsythia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know I already talked about it, but seriously, every day I walk out and there's something new blooming and I love this time i used to be so indifferent towards spring when i was living in an apartment because ugh, yeah whatever yeah right but i love it i love it everything looks dead for a month and then life just comes back and all the birds are singing and it's uh, i think it's gonna be another two weeks and then i can enjoy my morning coffee outside we're weeks behind you. We are weeks behind. It's freezing cold and pouring rain I saw. Today. I always follow your temperatures. Uh, Yours too. Mm. <laughs> I think that's it. That's it. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our other episodes, please leave us a rating and or review or a comment under our YouTube videos. Yes, Kelly, that was you we were talking about. Also, you can... Uh, leave a comment under each episode on Spotify now, which is so much fun for us. We love it. So much fun. Go check out our webpage, freshhellpodcast.com. There you find all the links you need. If you're interested, join our Patreon. We are having another get-together by end of March. We're going to record another Tell Me Everything. That's going to be really interesting and fascinating. Yeah, amazing. We have some really, really amazing, amazing tell me everything stories coming yeah. up. And yeah, if you want to support us, but don't know how, you know, the best and easiest way to support us is tell others, tell your friends, tell your colleagues, tell the people you employ, make them listen to us. Thank mm -hmm. you, Melissa and John. I love that. Yes. Amazing. Tell your dentist. Tell your phlebotomist, I swear. Lab people are our people. Every single time I'm getting blood drawn and people, they ask what I do and I'm like, I'm a podcaster and now I have those little cards to give them. And yeah. Yeah. Thanks to Tammy. Share it's us just like, on social media. Yeah. Share us in Facebook groups if somebody asks for a recommendation. Please. And that's the easiest way to support us. Yeah. Um, and it takes Doesn't cost a couple of minutes of your time. Yep. Yeah, exactly. that's right. We highly appreciate it. Please. Tell your pets we said hi. Love them, hug them, cuddle them, take care of them, take them to the vet, be kind to other humans, and most importantly, be kind to yourself. That's right. And if you are going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.